Rights team. Um, and today I'm going to talk a bit about um, what's been happening to our human rights online, um, what we can do about it, and how ranking digital rights fits into that ecosystem of advocacy. Um, so Ranking Digital Rights is a nonprofit research initiative. Uh, we work with an international network of partners to set global standards for how companies in the information and communications technology sector should respect freedom of expression and privacy. We also then rank 22 of the world's most powerful internet, mobile, and telecommunication companies on how transparent they are about um, their policies that affect users' rights. So as you can see on the slide, um, this is a map of the, of the 22 companies that we ranked in our most recent index, which we released in April of this year. Um, so first, let's talk about what's going on with our human rights online. This is a screenshot of um, the congressional testimony with Mark Zuckerberg, where he came to testify in front of Congress about um, what had happened with the Cambridge Analytica scandal this past spring. Um, so we've all seen the news, right? Over the past year or two, there's been increasingly bad news about when it comes to our rights to privacy and freedom of expression online. This is one of the most recent examples um, where the CEO of Facebook was called before Congress to talk about how his company had mishandled the vast amounts of user information that it collects about us, um, which had allowed the data of 87 million Facebook users to leak to Cambridge Analytica and be used for political targeting um, during several elections. We've also seen um, disruption of elections in other ways. Um, so according to Freedom on the Net's 2017 report, online manipulation and disinformation tactics had a role in elections in at least 18 countries um, from 2016 to 2017. So you can see in the slide, um, they measured the prevalence of these tactics in different countries included in their report. Um, things like pro-government media or paid online commentators, um, the use of political bots, and then also dissemination of fake news around elections. Um, this is something that we're seeing increase over the past few years. Um, and then, of course, the data breaches. 2017 was a huge year for data breaches. Um, we learned in the case of Yahoo that all 3 billion Yahoo accounts had been affected by the data breach at that company. Um, we've also seen data breaches from Equifax, from Uber, from other companies. Um, so this is increasingly a problem for the health and the security of the internet. Um, and then lastly, we've, we've also seen censorship of human rights related content. Um, so there's been a number of articles about making headlines about um, human rights activists and others documenting evidence of crimes against humanity and other human rights abuses, um, and then that content disappearing from platforms like YouTube, um, where it might be gone forever and won't be able to be used in um, criminal cases or advocacy campaigns another important um, means of addressing the human rights abuses in these conflicts. Um, so those are just a small sample of the issues that we're seeing making headlines over the past few years. There are, there are many more other um, issues going on that could take up a whole talk. Um, but these are kind of some of the, the big headlines that we've all seen. And what these all have in common is that in each case, the decisions that companies make have an impact on how users are able to exercise their rights. So at this point in time, given both the increasing power of global tech and telecommunication companies and the numerous documented cases in which these companies are infringing on users' rights, the question we have is how do we create an online environment where our human rights are actually protected? Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about ranking digital rights and kind of how, what our theory of change is when it comes to this question. Um, we take a particular approach to this. So as I mentioned earlier, we evaluate 22 of the world's most powerful internet and telecommunication companies on how transparent they are about their policies and their practices that affect users' rights. 
So you can see here, here's a map of um, the top social networks in each country as of January 2018. So all the blue countries are where Facebook is the top social network um, that people access on a regular basis. Um, in Russia, you can see the kind of tan color is for vContact. They're sort of, some people call it the Facebook-like equivalent in Russia. Um, Qzone in China, um, and then others around the world. Um, but you can see that, that Facebook kind of dominates a lot of the map here. Um, and then similarly, top websites that are accessed across the world, um, the light blue is all Google. And then we have in the light orange color is Baidu, um, VK again at the top, um, and then YouTube in some of the, the grayish pink countries you can see. Um, so we, we look at the 22 companies that have kind of the biggest footprint globally. Um, that's how we determined uh, which companies to include in our index. Um, oh, sorry. And so we evaluate these companies um, by creating a methodology, which is essentially a set of 35 benchmarks. Um, and we research how well companies' public disclosures meet these benchmarks. Um, our research goes through seven steps of review and verification, including a step where we share our preliminary findings with the companies themselves so they have an opportunity to respond to what we found um, and ask clarification questions about what it is that we're measuring. And then we then publish an annual index with top level findings and we release a public data set which has all the data that went into the rankings. So where do these standards come from? We created this methodology, it has a set of benchmarks. What's, what's the basis for, for our methodology? Um, so one of the, the founding frameworks for our project is um, the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Uh, these are a set of 31 principles that were adopted by the United Nations Human Rights Council in um, 2011. And they affirm that just as governments have a duty to protect human rights, companies also have a responsibility to respect human rights. So these principles include things like companies should avoid causing or contributing to adverse human rights impacts. They should seek to prevent or mitigate these adverse human rights impacts. Um, they should make policy commitments, um, conduct human rights impact assessments, and also provide access to remedy in cases where human rights have been infringed upon because of the company's actions. Um, we also take a cue from the Global Network Initiative Global Principles on Freedom of Expression and Privacy. These are commitments that were developed by companies, investors, academia, and civil society, um, which really focused on getting companies to consider and avoid the adverse impacts of government demands and government regulation um, on their users' rights. Companies who are members of the GNI commit to implement these principles, and they go through a regular review process. Um, so ranking digital rights methodology builds on these frameworks um, and also on several years of stakeholder engagement and drafting with a range of different organizations, companies, um, academics, and others who, who influenced um, our work and, and came to a consensus on what the sort of baseline things companies should be doing to demonstrate their respect for users' rights. Uh, so our index measures how transparent companies are. We're just asking companies to disclose what they do, what their policies are, what their commitments are. Um, it's, to be honest, it's a pretty low bar. Uh, it's not covering everything that companies should be doing in order to be respectful of human rights, but the idea is this is kind of the baseline of what companies who care about human rights can do to demonstrate um, their commitments. And there are also other important conversations um, to be had about these companies' business models um, whether these practices and policies are sustainable or compatible with a human rights focused online ecosystem. Um, those are also important conversations, um, but we're focused on the transparency part as a first step in that conversation to get companies to talk about what it is they're actually doing. So what does the Ranking Digital Rights Index tell us? These are our findings from the 2018 index, which we released in April. Um, so you can see we rank um, on the top is the 
internet companies. On the bottom is the telecommunication companies. Um, and it has their total scores as well as the breakdown of their scores for the three different categories in our methodology. These categories are governance, freedom of expression, and privacy. So in each one of those categories, there's a subset of benchmarks that have indicators and element questions that lay out what companies should be disclosing about their practices. Um, so a couple of things I want to point out about the findings. You'll see, for example, Google, Microsoft, and Oath um, rank top three overall. This doesn't necessarily mean that they're the best companies or um, that these are the companies that I would point to if someone was asking if, let's say, um, a human rights advocate in Azerbaijan said, you know, which companies should I use? This isn't necessarily like a foolproof indicator of, of that. It's an indicator of how transparent these companies are. So the top three companies are the ones that are disclosing the most information about the most things, um, since that's what we measure. We measure transparency. Um, and the results show that there's still gaps in disclosure for all of these companies. So some of these companies do particularly well in some areas and fall short in others. Um, and you'll notice the scores in the left-hand column indicate that only two companies, Google and Microsoft, um, got a D, if we were looking at this from an academic lens. Um, the rest of the companies got Fs, so no one's doing great. Um, and there's definitely room for improvement for everyone, um, but it's a tool. It's a tool to push companies to be better, to disclose more, and the methodology gives a roadmap for companies um, to do that. This year, we also um, published data on year-on-year -year trends. So we kept the methodology consistent from the 2017 index to the 2018 index, which allowed us to um, show where companies are either improving or declining in their disclosure. Um, and our findings this year showed that almost all the companies had at least some improvement. Um, and you can see in the graph, um, Apple, for example, had the highest improvement year on year. Um, they improved their disclosure of their governance policies. Um, they also improved in several areas where they disclosed information about their policies or their practices that they were already doing or they already had in place. They just hadn't focused on disclosing that information to the public, to their stakeholders. Um, so we, we saw a relatively large improvement from Apple this year. Um, in those areas. Twitter also had um, improvement in several areas around um, their human rights impact assessments, um, as well as how they respond to third party requests, um, like government requests to remove content or restrict accounts on their platform. Uh, the telecommunications company Telefonica improved um, their transparency reporting, which for those who aren't Familiar, a lot of companies now are adopting this practice where they release transparency reports that include information about their process, either for responding to takedown requests, removal requests, um, or requests to hand over user information. Um, for the telecommunication companies, and Telefonica in particular, they disclosed more information about how they respond to um, network shutdown requests from governments, and I'll go a bit more into that in a few minutes. Um, and then, so I've also highlighted, you'll see the, the three arrows that point to the telecommunication companies that joined the Global Network Initiative in the past year, um, or it was March of 2017. So Telefonica, Vodafone, and Orange all joined the GNI in the past year. Um, so we saw improvements from all three of those companies um, where they made meaningful changes to their disclosed policies and commitments as part of um, they're, they're joining the Global Network Initiative. And then the last thing I wanted to highlight for the year-on-year -year comparison is um, the Chinese companies. So I circled Baidu and Tencent, um, which both had improvements in their disclosure from the previous year, um, mostly in the area of how they handle user information. Um, so in the area of their privacy policies, um, what information they collect and, and retain those kind of practices. Um, so it shows that even in some of the more restrictive political environments, all of the companies in our ranking still have areas where they can improve their disclosure. 
Another one of the areas where we've seen improvements um, from the 2017 index to the 2018 index is um, companies' role in policing content or accounts on their own platforms. So this graph shows a number of indicators or benchmarks in our index that measures companies' disclosure of their policies for policing content. So it in includes the first two, which have to do with their own terms of service enforcement, and then um, the others have to do with their responses to government requests or third-party requests to remove content or restrict accounts on their platforms. Um, so we're seeing slight improvements across the board in this area, but again, there's a lot, um, there's still relatively low scores across the board. Um, we have seen more improvements on indicator F5, uh, which is specifically about the process for responding to third-party requests. Um, we've seen less improvement from companies around their process for enforcing their own rules. This is something that the broader civil society community has been pushing companies to be more transparent about for several years, and we're seeing slowly, slowly better disclosure in that area, um, but only from certain companies who are, I think, getting pressure the most. Um, and then finally, one area I wanted to point out was our indicator F4, which is data about terms of service enforcement. Um, this is an indicator that has really lagged over the past few years and is still lagging. You can see it's the lowest bar in this chart. Um, but we are starting to see steps toward improvement in this area. And again, this really has to do with a collaborative effort from a number of organizations um, and individuals who have been working on this issue to get companies to disclose actual data about their actions that they take to enforce their own rules on their platform. So, well, I'll go back for a second. So, disclosure on F4 has been very low for the past few years. Um, the slight increases that we've seen have mostly been anecdotal. So, companies will publish like a blog post saying, in these few months, we removed over a million accounts for like extremist activity or something like that. Um, but not comprehensive data by any means. So just in April, we started to see a few companies um, make big strides in this area. This was after our data was, we stopped our research cycle. Um, so this will be taken into account in the next research cycle. Um, but we saw Google release a report for YouTube where they um, broke down data for, um, that provides much more information about how much content they're removing, um, by what method they're removing this content, how it's being flagged or how it's coming to their attention, um, and then for what reasons, so what type of content is being removed. Um, so we saw this from YouTube, and then I think a week later, Facebook also released a report um, of a similar nature talking about giving data about how they enforce um, their community guidelines and their terms of service. Um, so this will be taken into account in the next cycle of our research, we're really excited to see companies start to disclose this kind of information in a similar way that they disclose information about government requests to remove data. Um, we also need to know what they're doing, how they're policing content on their own platforms. Um, so we've seen some improvements, uh, but there are also significant gaps in disclosure, and these gaps can sometimes serve as warning signs or areas um, to focus our advocacy. Uh, so one area that I'd like to point out is um, our, what we call our user information questions. So these are a set of um, seven privacy indicators that measure how transparent companies are about how they handle your user information. So things like what user information do they collect? Uh, what user information do they share? Who are they sharing it with? How long are they retaining this information? Do you have any control over what they're collecting, what they're doing with your user information. Um, so on these set of questions, we've seen, um, despite some improvements from a few companies, the average scores are still quite low. The highest score is 56 out of 100. Um, and this is a really important issue for a lot of us. It's also very much related to the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Um, and you'll see that Facebook's disclosure in this area is worse than many on many of the indicators um, compared to other companies. But no one is doing particularly well here. So Facebook kind of came under the fire for good reason, but it's also a broader trend that we should be concerned about. 
how little these companies are disclosing about how they handle our user information. Um, people don't really know what, what companies are doing with our user information, and that's because companies aren't clear about it. They are not really disclosing their practices um, very clearly. But we're, we're anticipating seeing some movement on these indicators over the next year with um, the GDPR in Europe and how companies decide to comply with that regulation. Um, we might see some movement on some of these indicators, hopefully in a positive direction. Um, another area that we measure in our index is security oversight. Um, so this includes what companies are disclosing about their practices to keep user data secure. Um, things like, do they have systems in place to limit and monitor employee access to user information? Do they disclose that they're conducting internal security audits? Do they disclose that they're conducting external security audits? Um, and as we can see, again, there are a few companies who are disclosing enough information here. Um, Google and Kakao um, from the internet companies and then AT&T as well. Um, but again, the scores across the board are, are relatively low. And this also relates closely to another indicator in our index, which is about policies for responding to data breaches. As we know, this is a big issue for the security of the internet, for the security of our user information. Um, so we want companies to disclose, you know, in the event that you don't properly secure user information or a data breach occurs, what steps are you going to take to remedy the situation? Um, so we ask, that companies disclose that they will notify the relevant authorities, um, that they'll notify affected users, and we want them to disclose what steps they'll take to address the impact of the data breach on their users. So two of the, the first two things are, in many jurisdictions, already required by law. These are things that companies usually have to do anyways, um, but we're asking they disclose public commitments um, to do this and then also to make clear to users what they'll do about the adverse impacts that might um, affect users because of, of these data breaches. So we've seen very few companies disclosing um, these commitments, um, even though in, in it's a pretty low bar for, for companies to disclose um, that they will do what is legally required and then also what steps they'll take um, to remedy the situation. So this is an area that we've been watching to, to try and push companies to be more transparent um, and, and get them to improve their policies. And then finally, um, we have an indicator on network shutdowns, which pertains to um, the telecommunication companies that we rank in the index. Um, from a number of civil society organizations have been doing research on this issue um, over the past few years. Access Now, in particular, has been documenting the prevalence of network shutdown requests or demands um, around the world. And um, the, the number of the instances of network shutdown requests are increasing, and telecommunication companies play a key role in these events. Um, so we understand that Oftentimes, companies are um, constrained in how they can respond to these kinds of demands, but we want them to have clear policies in place um, for how, what their process looks like for responding to these requests, and we want them to disclose that information so their users have that information as well. Um, and again, this is an area where we have seen some improvements in disclosure over the past um, year. You can see this is a year-on-year -year comparison between the 2017 scores and the 2018 scores. Um, however, disclosure across the board remains low. No company scores over 50% on this indicator. Um, so what does all this data tell us? Um, and how does it help us kind of move toward holding companies accountable for their impact on human rights online? Um, one of the things that this data tells us is it helps us understand kind of what the problems are and what the gaps, where there are gaps in disclosure, um, and then hold companies accountable for how their actions and their stated human rights commitments compare to their disclosed policies. So an example of this um, that comes up a lot is the terms of service enforcement uh, indicators. So we want companies to be transparent about 
what their rules are, either in their terms of service or their community guidelines, and how they enforce their, those rules. Um, that isn't enough to ensure that, they are, that their policies are sound, that they're enforcing them in a consistent way, as we've all seen with some of these companies. Um, it's often a very incoherent set of policies in terms of how they're stated or how they're implemented. Um, but without knowing, without forcing companies to disclose what the policies are, there's no way for us to engage with those companies, to improve their policies, or to have a sense of how their internal policies align with how they're actually implementing their enforcement um, in practice. So transparency can help us have a better conversation, have better advocacy campaigns, more targeted advocacy campaigns. Um, it's not a fix in and of itself, um, but it can increase trust between users and companies um, and help kind of build that um, bridge that relationship. It also gives stakeholders information they need to push companies to improve their practices. And it gives, it provides data to show where companies are failing to disclose important information. It also shows where, where there's room for improvement, especially when we look at companies in similar jurisdictions. If one company is outperforming the other, it's clear that there aren't legal restrictions preventing that company from disclosing information because other companies in that jurisdiction are able to disclose that information as well. Um, so what can you do with this information if you are interested in using it? Um, there's a lot of things that you can do. We put our methodology online, um, so it can be used as a framework for asking companies questions. Um, if you're an investor, there's information on our website for how to use the index findings, including an investor brief. So I put an excerpt from our investor brief up there um, with key questions that investors can ask companies in order to um, push companies to have adopt better policies that are more respectful of human rights and also ask them if they don't have those policies, why don't they have them? Um, there's also a lot of resources on our website that I wanted to highlight. So if you go to rankingdigitalrights.org backslash index 2018, um, you can find the breakdown of all of our rankings um, for the past year, but there's also a lot of resources in here. Um, so if you, if you go up to the resources tab, that's where you'll find the investor brief. Um, on the, the second bar at the top, you can click on either companies or services, and that will give you a much more detailed breakdown of how these companies perform on all 35 indicators. Um, you can also see how they compare with, with other companies and you can look at the different individual services. So for each company that we rank, we give them an overall score, um, but for each of those companies, there are a number of services that we evaluate that make up that score. So for Facebook, for example, we look at Facebook, the social network platform, we look at um, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, and Instagram. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, Oh, and then the last thing I wanted to point out is the download button up there um, is where all our data lives. So if you are a person who loves to work with data, if you love to work in spreadsheets, you can find and download our entire spreadsheet with all of our data, everything that went into the rankings this year. Um, and we encourage you if, you, if you like to play around with data, definitely download it and play around with it. There's a lot of different ways that you can work with the data to find interesting comparisons between companies. Um, you can also highlight issues that are important to you by digging through the indicators. Um, and so if you're interested in doing that, I mean, feel free to do it, but we'd also love to hear about it if you um, decide to, to do some of that digging around. Um, Sorry, I'm having a hard time now reading my notes because the lights keep changing. Um, oh, and then finally, um, adaptations of our methodology. So as I mentioned, our methodology is all available online. Um, we can't rank and evaluate all the companies in the world because we only, there's like six of us on staff, um, so we can only do so many things, but we encourage others to take the methodology and adapt it um, to local or regional research projects. Um, there's been, we've worked with a couple different groups already um, who have taken our methodology and applied it to rank either companies that we don't rank or ones in a specific um, region. So I worked with some folks in New York um, to look at 
the different internet service provider options for residents of New York and how transparent they are about their privacy policies. So if you live in New York, you can definitely check that out. It's an interesting report. Um, but we, we are open to working with um, other research organizations to do these kind of adaptations in order to get the research out into the world and, and provide more opportunities for advocacy. So kind of to close, uh, where do we go from here? I think there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from the environmental movement. Um, other talks have also mentioned this, and it's something that we, we reference um, when talking about our methodology. There have been successful examples of pushing companies to do the right thing um, over years and decades of advocacy, um, things like public pressure, things like positive, well-written regulation, um, things like divestment campaigns. Um, we've already seen several investor groups um, taking a stand uh, against some company practices over the past few months. Um, so there, there's a lot that we can do, and this is just one part of the equation of the efforts needed in order to hold companies accountable um, and push for greater transparency. So I think in closing, we need to continue to think about, you know, what kind of future do we want from the online ecosystem and, and how do we push for uh, that better future. So thank you, everyone. And I think we have a little bit of time for questions. So if anyone has questions, can go up to the mic in the middle. I just wanted to ask about the uh, indicators. You mentioned governance. Uh, I'm wondering if you could say more about what specifically you're looking at. Sure, governance. absolutely. Thank you. So the question was about our governance indicators and, and talking a bit more about what we include and what we measure. Um, so the governance indicators measure the company as um, at the group level. Uh, so what policies they disclose about um, the, the commitments they make to human rights and how they implement those commitments throughout the company as a whole. Um, so there are six indicators in that category. We measure, the first indicator is, does the company make a commitment to respect freedom of expression and privacy as human rights? Um, and we, we specifically look for language referencing human rights frameworks, because um, some companies will talk about protecting user information and things like that, but not privacy as a human right. Um, we look at um, whether there is uh, commitments from different levels within the company um, to oversee the implementation of these commitments to human rights. So we look at board level, um, executive level, and management level um, commitments to oversee the implementation of, of these human rights policies. Um, we look at human rights impact assessments, so we ask that companies disclose that they conduct regular human rights impact assessments to um, anticipate whether there might be human rights concerns arising from the rollout of a new service or um, entering a new market, um, things like that, and how the services they already have might be infringing on user rights. Um, and then we also look at um, access to remedy, so, uh, which, is, which comes from the UN Guiding Principles on Human Rights. Um, does the company disclose some kind of avenue for users to um, approach the company, contact the company if they feel their rights have been infringed upon? Uh, so those are, those are roughly the indicators that make up uh, the governance section. Any other questions? The mic is back on. Oh, the mic is back on if you want to use the mic. I don't see anyone getting up, so if, if there are no more questions, um, you'll feel free to contact me um, 
if any questions come up or if you're interested in learning more about our index or the methodology, I'm always happy to talk about our methodology. Um, please check out the index and you can learn more about our findings there. And um, if no more questions, then I'll wrap it up. Thanks very much.